it is not all that hard to identify anime visually by when they were created. 70s, 80s, 90s, noughties, 2010s, never. Some of these tells are in the styles of character designs, whether it's painted cells or digital colouring, and the aspect ratio it was broadcast at. In the 2000s, we saw the rise of DigiPaint. It was a stark contrast and it lost some of the texture of hand-painted cells, but it sped up the process. And we didn't stop there. Anime projects an idea of a three-dimensional world with backgrounds, animation and effects. But how do you sell that idea to an audience who's watching on their flat television screen? Simple, you create a 3D space yourself. This was the multi-plane camera. Once all of the individual elements were complete, it would be up to a director of photography and their photography department to place each element onto each layer and take a picture for every complete frame. In this way, you get a feeling of depth, because there was actual real depth to begin with. This in turn prompted several new cinematic techniques. One of the most famous was parallax scrolling. By moving different layers at different depths in a different way, you could create the illusion of distance. But of course, when you think about it, this is also a pain in the ass, especially when we now have a digital alternative. And so in the 90s and early noughties, with the rapidly increasing availability of the technology, anime was photographed, or more accurately, composited together on computers. Today, Adobe After Effects is industry standard, and during the 2010s, directors of photography retaining their old titles from the multiplane camera days have been able to explore deeper into After Effects' capabilities. When I was younger, a bunch of my friends enjoyed playing around with their pirated copies of After Effects, seeing what cool effects they could make. Freddie Wong and Corridor Digital were YouTube superstars, and now people who love digital effects as much as we did are helping to define what anime looks like today. At this point, it should be understood that director of photography is a misleading term. It's misleading in the same way in Japanese as well. But to clarify, in film, a director of photography is on set, leading the camera work. They are a part of production. But for anime, photography, or more accurately compositing, is a post-production job. In fact, it's the final visual step. Gargantua on the Verderous Planet DOP Koji Tanaka started out his career as an animator, but he disliked the idea of slaving away for days on animating one small part of a show, and so he pivoted to compositing, because it meant that instead of just one part, he was defining the look of the entire final product, bringing everything together, adding lighting effects, sparkles in the eyes, and making the Gargantua fleet feel huge and beautiful. He'd then show that to the director, and that was it that was the show, albeit without sound yet. And in essence, that's the role of director of photography in anime. They are the last line of defense. It is a frequently misunderstood role, even when translated properly to compositing. The R Anime Awards, which I love, have specific categories for several aspects of animation production, including compositing, although many people have spoken about how they don't really understand what the role entails. And in a way, this is a good thing. You probably won't realize when anime creators get it right, but you can tell when they've gotten it wrong. Compositing staff say that when their work goes unnoticed, then that's proof that they've done their job well. Instead, they just aim to make sure that viewers are getting absorbed in these worlds. For Koji Tanaka and Gargantia, he specifically states that if viewers notice the post-processing, then he feels like he's screwed up. But that doesn't mean it should be invisible. Rather, if everything still feels like it exists in the same scene, then you can get really ambitious. Digital compositing can be an appeal. One of my favourite shows from last year, Akadama Drive, relied on it in creating its unique cyberpunk world. And in fact, I'd argue that the mega hit success of the highest grossing anime film of all time was at least partially due to Ufotable's digital team and their ability to create atmosphere with digital lighting effects. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> 
Starting with Manabi Strait and much more obviously the Garden of Sinners films, Yufa Table's in-house director of photography Yuichi Tarao started employing more and more digital environments and effects. For him, his approach is twofold. He wants to recreate the imagery and lighting that exists in the real world, while also showing off what's great about his colleagues' work. Like most anime staff, everything these digital creators do is to serve and deliver the story in the best way possible. For example, Fate Stay Night Heaven's Feel was a big step for the studio's creative output, and it challenged each and every one of them. But through a collaborative approach, the digital team were able to match the lighting of the backgrounds to constantly reflect the tension of each scene, especially in the first film. Presage Flower is all about a creeping horror and enemies hiding in the shadows, so Tyrell made sure that even for brightly lit scenes, there would often be a dark corner or space that would keep viewers on their toes. Like Tanaka, he also believes that if viewers aren't thinking about the compositing, then that's for the best. But this is somewhat sabotaged by the fact that most teams can't or won't create shows that have this much congruence between the separate elements. Part of this is interpersonal. Tyrell has worked at Yufa Table for almost 20 years. They all know each other and what they're capable of, and the studio layout has only encouraged this, making it so each of the departments are close by. Kyoto Animation has the exact same advantage. They don't focus on just one director of photography like Yufa Table tends to, but those that work on the digital team are familiar enough with the other departments to match the director's ambitious visions. At other teams, you'll still get excellent results that match the sort of lighting detail and effects that we see with modern anime, but it's going to be hard to match Yufa Table and Kyoto Animation. In fact, to do so, you're going to need someone like Kentaro Waki. I interviewed Kentaro Waki back in 2019 about his work on Sora Online Alicization, which was airing at the time. And what was impressive is that he was able to evolve the aesthetic of everything he worked on, despite his work being outsourced from Asahi Production, and not having the long, intimate relationships that Tarao's work was built on. I first looked up his name after watching Gundam Thunderbolt. Gundam Through the Ages has always wanted to portray a three-dimensional space, and Waki he's been able to nail it with the digital camera flying past all of this floating debris. And then there were the effects. Of course, they're all based on the 2D animator's work, but the extra sparks and colours were mesmerising, and the light reflected back onto the mechs to prove to us that they all exist in the same scene. He then brought this skill set to Sword Art Online Ordinal Scale and later Alicization, where the goal was once again to increase the impact of the effects and match the aesthetics of each scene. This was particularly interesting in Alicization when it came to the lighting of the two primary locations. The underworld needs to feel calm and beautiful, in the early episodes at least, so you get this recreation of a perfect summer's day in anime form. Meanwhile, back in the real world, the control room is mainly lit from one source, the screens. Compositing is as much science as it is art, and so Waki would have had to get the values perfect to keep these visuals consistent while keeping everyone lit realistically. Today, Waki works most heavily on the Gundam series, serving as director of photography for Gundam Narrative, the Reconquista in G compilation films where he's been redoing some of his work from 2014, and most significantly, the new Gundam Hathaway film, which includes the best compositing I've ever seen in an anime. Modern anime is all about drawing viewers into its multi-layered world, and using compositing to achieve a vision that couldn't be done before. It's still based on the work of all the 2D animators and background artists, but Hathaway uses these as building blocks to create an incredibly ambitious film. There are plenty of shots where the camera moves in ways that you wouldn't expect for anime, like the first person view. This is difficult to pull off in a 2D medium, but it's not impossible, and Kintaro Waki had done it before in Gundam Thunderbolt. The layouts for the show were created in 3D, and then that was used as a reference for how Waki and his team could construct the 2D and 3D assets to retain that feeling of depth. 
and because of the complexity of the film, this could require up to 140 different layers within After Effects, where events in the background continue to affect objects in the foreground. And while not everything has to be super complicated, everything does have to fit. Waki is a huge fan of hand-drawn animation, and instead of VFX artists, his inspirations are all animators. And so, while there are people that worry that anime will just be flashy digital VFX in the future, the goal is always to respect the intent of the 2D animation staff. In this video, I've talked about two of my favourite compositing artists who I feel are moving the medium forwards. But even if it's not as dramatic as the works of these creators, there's plenty of others who are creating great works in different ways. For instance, while Yuichi Tarao and Kintaro Waki aim for cinematic depth, not every show actually wants that. Mob Psycho 100's digital team at Bones kept things feeling fairly flat, while also making sure the lighting was consistent and the psychic power Hours felt unique. The Megalobox team was dedicated to making the show feel like it was being watched through an old VHS player, giving the line work a slightly retro feel. In fact, Kentaro Waki took on a similar task for Gundam The Origin, where he turned modern 3D animation into something that looks like it was made 40 years ago. Fire Force's DOP was very focused on creating fire effects that suited each particular scene. Princess Connect Redive was all about magical spells and keeping the direction of the sun consistent. And of course, Kazuhiro Yamada made a name for himself with the seamless combination between 2D action and 3D backgrounds in Attack on Titan. There's so much that can be achieved within this stage of production. Even stuff like smooth line work can be a part of the compositing process. Animator Reiji has an excellent YouTube tutorial on how to achieve the anime look in After Effects, and one of the tools he uses is OLM Smoother, a plugin from the studio behind Pokemon that smooths over the artifacting that often occurs in digital illustration. As he shows in his video, you can achieve a believable anime look without too many steps. You don't need to go all Gohans with adding so many digital elements until it makes you want to vomit. It's scalable. And VFX is one of those industries that's constantly building as more plugins and software become available. It's really then up to the artist to decide which of these will help them achieve the visuals and deliver the narrative they're aiming for. Thanks for watching The Canopy Effect. I'd recommend watching Reiji's channel for a first hand look at what it means to create anime esque works from start to finish. He's currently working on a My Hero Academia fan animation and detailing his steps along the way from storyboard to compositing. But before you head off, I'd like to thank these incredible people for supporting the channel. In particular, I'd like to thank Austin Hardwick, Dedemeet, Eddie Lehecker, Edwin Shale, Equinoctes, Faux Wizard, Frizzy Canadian. Canadian, Frogkun, Fuji, Jacob Bosley, JR Pictures, My Own Mother, Naila Drink, Nolan Soga, Quentin Alkin Smith, Robert Miller, Ryan Taylor, and Tom Araman. If you want to support more videos just like this, feel free to visit patreon.com/slash the Effect.